Hello, this is Dr. Jake Abbott, and in this video we're going to be talking about discrete time, bounded input, bounded output stability. Uh, this video presumes that you have watched and understand the previous video on continuous time, bounded input, bounded output stability, and I'm going to make references to those concepts and sort of compare and contrast discrete time versus continuous time. So if you don't understand continuous time, you'd be better off watching that video again before moving on to this video. So I'm using this term discrete time uh, because the book uses that term. I, I'd be tempted to just get rid of the time altogether and just say discrete because time doesn't really have to be um, a factor here at all. But since I guess things do march forward in some sort of sense, there's no harm in saying discrete time. Um, so I'll keep using that terminology. So uh, in the um, continuous time video, we saw that the impulse response of a system was very important, and it will be in this case as well. Uh, our impulse response is a little bit different now, so let's just begin um, sort of laying the groundwork. We're saying for discrete systems or discrete time systems, we're evaluating our, our system at the next step equal to some linear combination of the states at this step, step k plus the inputs right now at step k, and then our output y at step k is always equal to some linear combination of our states and our inputs. Okay, so this is our, our standard discrete system or discrete time system, and so we're going to be interested in the impulse response of such a system, and so for impulse response, we're going to be looking at u as a function of k, and because it is discrete, it only exists on the sample. So if here's 0, here's 1, here's 2, there is no k 1.5, there is no k 2.5. So I'm going to move along here, and I've been at 0 for all time until now, and then right at 0, I'm going to go to a magnitude of 1 and then I'm going to drop right back down to 0 afterwards. So this is the impulse response in discrete time. So u of k equals to 1 oh sorry equals uh, u of k equals 1 at k equals 0 and u of k equals 0 for all k is not equal to 0. And for continuous time we were looking our impulse was defined differently it actually went to infinity at time 0 and was infinitesimally thin and the area under the curve was 1. Well here there is no area under the curve and so this this um, impulse is defined differently and it's much simpler in some ways it just goes to 1 at 0 and it's 0 the rest of the time. And so this is all our impulse response and if we give our um, and, and, of, and, and just like with continuous time systems for right now I'm restricting myself to single input single output systems so u is a scalar and y is also a scalar. So just like with continuous time systems, if I give this system an impulse response, I will observe some output response. And, um, and it is sort of, it could be somewhat arbitrary of what it looks like. So I give it some impulse response and the assumption is that it's been zero up until then. And I give it an impulse response and then I watch this. So here's one, two, three. I watch this thing do something maybe it has some sort of exponential kind of decay but it only exists on the samples so I call this so if um, y of k for u of k equal to the impulse response delta is what I call the impulse response and I'll call that g of k so this is the impulse response of my system g of k so just as with continuous time systems, I can actually think about um, my output signal y of k as the convolution, which now instead of an integral is a summation from m equals 0 to k of g at k minus m times u at m. And that's also equal to, these are just equivalent statements, summation from m equals 0 to k of g evaluated at m times u at k minus m. So basically my output signal is some combination of an impulse response some time ago that is decaying away plus some other impulse response 
times another uh, impulse response, and those all of these are decaying away at different at different times, and you add them all up, and you get y of k. And the logic is the same as the logic as it was with continuous time systems. So for discrete time systems, what we say is we we first define bounded inputs the exact literally the exact same way as we did for for continuous time systems. So we say if the magnitude of u is less than or equal to some constant, which we can call um, which is which is a finite number that's smaller than infinity, for all k greater than or equal to zero, this is a bounded input. This is the definition of a bounded input. Same, it's it's really the same as with continuous systems. So then, if we want to start talking about bounded input, bounded output stability, that is also literally the exact same definition. And the reason it's the same is because this is sort of the intuitive definition. It's it's a it's not a mathematical definition. It's a it's a, a concept definition. A system is bounded input, bounded output stable if every bounded input results in a bounded output. And that literally means ev every. If even a single bounded input results in an unbounded output, then you're not bounded input, bounded output stable. It has to be true for everyone. And just like with continuous time systems, this is a very difficult thing to prove experimentally because you can't give it every possible bounded input. So just like with bounded input, bounded output stability, we can start looking at other underlying properties of our system response, and in particular our impulse response, to see if it truly is bounded input, bounded output stable. With continuous time systems, there was this concept of ab absolute integrability of our impulse response. And we have something really similar with discrete time systems, and we say a discrete time system is absolutely summable. So I'm going to look at absolutely summable, uh, summability is probably the right way to say it, of g of k. And that definition is if the summation from k equals 0 to infinity of the magnitude of g of k is less than or equal to some m, some number that's less than infinity. It can be huge. It can be 50 billion. It just can't be infinity. So as long as m exists, that this is true, then we say g of k is absolutely summable. And remember, g of k is our impulse response of our system. If our impulse response is absolutely summable, then our system is bounded input, bounded output stable. And, and it is a two-way street. Bounded input, bounded output stable, if and only if, which is a double arrow, g of k is absolutely summable. I probably shouldn't use AS because in the future we'll often use that to refer to asymptotic stability. But in this case, I'm saying g of k is absolutely summable. So now this is something you actually can test because rather than giving your system every possible input and seeing if it's bounded, we just give it one input, the impulse. And we see if this, if this integral is a, less than a finite number. And just like with a um, continuous time systems with discrete time systems, we can look at the transfer function and we can get sort of um, some sort of standard system responses that we will see over and over from, from real systems. So we talk about transfer functions um, in continuous time system as some g of s. In this case, we're going to have some g of z, which is uh, the z transform of g of k. So if, our, if g of k is our um, is our impulse response g of z is the the z transform of g of k and this is this is a linear transformation that's a, analogous to a laplace transform laplace transform acts on continuous time systems and z transform acts on discrete systems but they have many of the same properties and it's defined g of z um, is defined as the summation from m equals 0 to infinity of g of m times z to the minus m. And so this is just like, a, this is like the anal analogy to the Laplace transform definition. So basically you can take any signal in discrete time and you can transform it into a signal in z transform. And you can go back, back and forth between these. So if we 
have our discrete impulse response and we write that in this z domain so as a transfer function then and and this is just like any other transfer function so this is a this is a ratio of our output signal to our input signal so there are going to be a couple of things that are going to be true for us if our system is bounded input bounded output stable so if we're bounded input bounded output stable as k goes to infinity so we're looking at what happens as our signal evolves in time two things will happen if um, first if u of k is basically a sinusoidal signal now this is kind of a funny thing because it remember it doesn't exist all the time so when you plot it it won't look like it won't look like a straight sinusoid it looks like something more like dot 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 because it only exists at these discrete points but it still looks like a sinusoid so if we give this kind of input then we will have the same sort of result as we did for continuous time systems so we'll evaluate g of z where z is equal to e to the j omega so we substitute e to the j omega in for z at every location sine omega k plus angle of g e at j omega so you just evaluate your transfer function substituting in e and j again is the imaginary number e to j omega for every z and you see that we get another sinusoid out if our sin if we have a sinusoid input and it is phase shifted and scaled it's a very similar result to the discrete time and then just as with discrete time we have a special case which is a step input so if u of k is just equal to some constant a for all k then we get our output approaching something that looks like g evaluated at one times a so again we we can talk about this thing as the dc gain in continuous time we we had to find the dc gain we set s equal to zero for discrete time we set z equal to one but still it says that if we give a step input over time our system will look like a step output if it's bounded input bounded output stable and that output is scaled by this dc gain so just as with continuous time systems we we can look at the poles of this transfer function so if g of z is equal to some numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial then this transfer function is bounded input bounded output stable if and only if it's again a double arrow every every pole of g of z is inside the open unit circle so what we're saying here is we have our real real imaginary plane and we're plotting our poles of this transfer function and there's this circle that has magnitude one so it goes through this point one here one here minus one here minus one here every pole has to be in this open circle and when I say open I mean does not include the circle that would be the closed unit circle if it did include the circle so not including the circle so if every pole circle sorry if every pole of g of, of g of z is inside the open the open unit circle then the system is bounded at input bounded output stable if even a single pole is outside of the open circle or even on the line then it is not bounded input bounded output stable and just like with um, continuous time systems the the poles of g of z are the same things as the roots of d of z equals zero those those same terminologies exist so everything until this point has been derived for single input single output transfer functions but we want to understand how this applies to multi-input multi-output transfer functions and just like with continuous time every single element needs to be needs to be bounded input bounded output stable so we're going to have some big transfer function matrix now that's going to look like some huge thing with all of our little impulse responses so g11 of k and down here is g 
n n of k. Oh, I shouldn't. I actually shouldn't imply that these are square. So m n, let's say, because you can have different number of outputs to, to inputs. So every single one of these little transfer functions needs to be bounded input, bounded output stable. And if it is, then your entire multi-input, multi-output system is bounded input, bounded output stable. And again, if even a single entry is not, then the whole system is not.